My name's Sarah Perkins. I'm a research fellow at the Climate Change Research Centre and my field of research is heat waves. So I look at heat waves. I currently have a research grant to analyse how they've changed, why they've changed, what drives heat waves, how those drivers interact with each other, um, and the human contribution behind those changes as well. So heat waves, they're very complex as I'm discovering. Um, I guess the term heat wave is quite an, you know, anecdotal. You hear it in the press and say, oh, there's a heat wave. Well, what does that mean? Oh, it's a bit hot. Okay, well, so that, that's what kind of got me into my research was what actually is a heat wave? What does it mean? And how do we measure them? And it turns out that there's a lot, there are lots of ways of measuring them. It depends what you're interested in. If you're interested in human health, you might measure it differently to someone who's interested in flying foxes or fruit bats. Um, you might include different variables like relative humidity, you might not, you might just want to look at temperature, you might want to look at nighttime temperature only, there's a pl there is literally a plethora of ways. But the way we're trying to bre break it down, the climate community is looking at their intensity, so how hot the hottest part of a heat wave is, or the hottest day I guess, their duration, how long the heat waves go for, their frequency, both in terms of the number of heat wave days you may get in a season, and also the overall number of discrete heat wave events. Uh, their spatial extent, so how big is a singular event, what area does it cover, uh, and their timing, so how early does the heat wave season start. Um, I haven't looked at this myself, but also how late does the heat wave season end, so is it broadening, is it shrinking, etc. So they're the sorts of different ways that we really look at heat waves. You can also look at the average magnitude, so the, you know, just the average intensity of an event. You can do other things like combine all those indices together to get one you know, magical heat wave index, which I don't think works very well personally. But and those sorts of all those characteristics of heat waves are potentially affected differently by different physical mechanisms, and that's what we're trying to nut out. What drives heat wave intensity? Is it different to what drives heat wave timing? Does that also affect heat wave duration? If not, what's what what drives those sorts of different things? Heat waves have occurred in the natural climate record before. I'm not going to deny that. Um, particularly in summer, it's hot. <laughs> Occasionally you'll get three or four days that line up and, and form a hot event. That's, that's true, I agree with that. However, they are changing. They are increasing in their int intensity, frequency, duration, and also how early they occur in the season. That's what we're concerned about. You know, if, 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 if we didn't exist, yes, heat waves would still occur, but they wouldn't occur as often, and they wouldn't be occurring as high, at, at higher intensity or as early. That's what we're concerned about. And there's also the argument that um, climate change has happened before and greenhouse gases have been higher before than what they are now, particularly carbon dioxide, which is also true. But the reasons for them being high were different. The reasons why there was more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere however long ago, before the Industrial Resolution, um, it was natural. It was how the Milankovitch cycles were changing, how gosh, I don't know, species were changing and things were evolving. It wasn't because we were digging up coal and burning it. The reasons were different and that's what I'm concerned about. Not the fact, well the fact that it's changing, the fact that that's directly attributable to our activities. Mm. Different locations are exhibiting different changes of different magnitudes, but generally overall, all those sorts of characteristics of heat waves are increasing. So it depends how long the observational record is. Over Australia, we can look back in some locations as far back as 1910 over the globe, really the best data set that we can use only goes back to 1950 with any sort of um, reliability. In terms of observed data, I have looked at heat waves in Australia, over Australia and globally as well. Uh, at the moment I have almost three PhD students looking at Australian events, but my research in terms of projections and what's changing them and the human contribution behind those changes, I'm trying to do that at a global scale as well. There's a few methods that you can use to work out the human contribution. Um, I'm at the moment using a methodology called the fraction of attributable risk. So it's working out what fraction or what's, what's the percentage behind a particular event in terms of its likelihood of occurring. So it's the same kind of analysis that doctors use for studying the risks of cancer in smokers versus non-smokers or, or cases like that. So we look at event, say the hottest year on record last year or the you know, number of heat waves we had last year, compare that in a model to conditions where we don't have climate change, where it's just the climate as if we didn't exist, and work out how often that particular event occurred in both of those cases. Then we compare them and it's just a matter of comparing two probabilities or two percentages and then you get that, that attributable risk factor. 
how much are humans contributing to the increase in heat waves? Ah, oh, that's a good question. It's currently what I'm working on now. It depends what sort of characteristic you're looking at. So we're seeing a much larger contribution from humans in heat wave frequency. That's a detectable signal that we're already seeing. It's only going to get worse. And even at the moment, it's, I'm actually quite surprised at how large it is. So it's around about, if, if we look at a heat wave that occurs once every 20 years on average, that event now compared to say 50 years ago or 30 years ago, it now occurs 16 times more often. So it's not quite once a year, but almost once a year now. So that's, that, that is like for an area average, that's like maybe say for the entire of Australia. Um, but it is quite scary that we're seeing these already quite detectable changes. Um, that is preliminary results, so I need to look into that a bit more. Um, the heat wave metrics I'm looking at, I have only looked at one model, I've still got a lot of work ahead of me, but this model is certainly indicating that for heat wave frequency, we're seeing 16 times more likely, but for heat wave intensity, it's a bit less. It's around about nine or 10 times more likely. It depends what you're looking at, where you're looking at, how you're mm. defining heat waves. Yeah. You're seeing, I'm seeing larger signals when I look at Australia as a continent, averaged. If I look at, say, Southeast Australia, so that's like Victoria, New South Wales, um, it's a lot less because you've got natu a lot more natural variability you know, or internal variability, which you average out at the continental scale. So it depends. If I did that globally, I would get an even stronger signal again. Talking about increases in risk in terms of heat waves or any other extreme event, I find it helpful. And I know some people that find it helpful, but other people tend to really struggle with probability. So, you, you know, perhaps the cancer anal analogy fails here because if you say you're, you know, twice as likely to get cancer if you smoke cigarettes, people go, oh, goodness me, that's not good. But you're twice as likely to experience this, this number of heat waves now. People can't, I think it's, it's still something that's a bit more, um, that's what I'm looking for, abstract to them. It's still not something that's in there, you know, that, that directly affected by, you know, you light the cigarette, you're responsible for yourself getting cancer. But with heat waves, it's still something, or any other extreme event, it's still very much removed from their everyday life. That's, that's, that's something that I'm trying to tackle at the moment. How do you communicate? Um, Europe, actually, is showing a lot of changes. So, you know, over regions where we saw the Russian heat wave, the 2003 heat wave, parts of, um, Eastern Asia, they're showing increases. Southeastern Australia, that's where we're seeing most increases in heat wave intensity. Um, we don't have enough data, unfortunately, for Africa, basically all of Africa or India, or the Arctic or Antarctic, so I can't say what's going on there. South America, we've only got a little bit of data and I'm not sure how good it is. And actually in America, we've, um, so that the western parts of America are showing increases, but there is the, the, the warming hole, as it's called, in the, in the central eastern part. So that's, that's actually, that's in a lot of the temperature records that that area hasn't warmed as much, or if at all, and a lot of that's actually been put down to land cover change. So there's a reason for that, but perhaps if that didn't happen, then it'd be equally as warm as the rest of the continent. So if, if you look, the models don't pick it up because they, they haven't incorporated that sort of land cover change into, the model itself, if it is put in, there has been, I, I, this is not my area of expertise, but there is, there is quite a bit of literature out there that if you do incorporate the land cover change and the, the hypotheses why we think it's happened, the models do pick it up. Um, but yeah, if you look at something like had crew T, I look at had GHC and D, you can see it. So, so no change or maybe a slight decrease, but there's physical explanations behind that. It's not that we're stuffing up. Unfortunately, it's not the people who are causing the problems that will be most affected. So, you know, America and us are the highest emitters per capita, but it's the people in the developing natures that, uh, regions that will be affected most. Uh, so poor old Kiribati is already having saltwater intrusion and inundation and sea level rise, and they're not putting any greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Those that are low-lying, those that um, don't have access to things like air conditioning or good public health infrastructure. You know, if you get a heat wave in those sorts of areas, people get sick or the elderly generally get really sick after a heat wave. If they don't have the public infrastructure to cope with that, more people will unfortunately be killed. Um, 
if we see higher intensity of tropical cyclones, they generally occur in the tropics and we do have a lot of developing nations in the tropics. They simply don't have the infrastructure. So it's really, it's really unfortunate and really unfair that those people aren't causing the problems will be the people who will be affected the most. In any society, the people who are most affected by heat waves are generally the elderly and the very sick. So it is actually somewhat difficult to attribute deaths directly to heat waves because they aggravate underlying conditions. So you might have a heart problem, um, maybe a problem trying to in, being able to cool yourself down or something like that. And the heat wave, if you're prolonged in, in a period of prolonged heat, it will aggravate those sorts of those sorts of problems. Perhaps that sort of illness may have killed you a little bit earlier than what you would have died of natural causes, but the heat wave brings that earlier still. So you, I, the way they measure it, they look at um, mortality data, I think maybe a few days after the heat wave or for, for a period after the event and work out, well, what do they normally expect at this time of year and what did they actually get? And then that's what they attribute to, to the heat event. There's a lot of work going on at looking at flying foxes at the moment, particularly in Queensland. Unfortunately, they tend to drop, literally drop out of the trees at 42 degrees Celsius, so lactating mothers and their babies. I think yesterday or the other day, a colony of 5,000 in Queensland, yep. And, it's, and that's, that's not the only one that's happened here in Sydney. It's happened, I think, further south. Um, I know it's certainly of that one. So that's an example of an animal that has a high threshold, oh sorry, a, a finite threshold. For us, I'm not entirely sure what our threshold is. We, we can adapt at least to different climates and we have the benefit of being able to walk into an air conditioned building. Um, but different animals would have their own thresholds and they may or not, may not be particularly sensitive to that threshold. Was that climate scientists getting their satellites to, um, to form a little heat bubble over the city? Or? No, that was not climate scientists trying to create a heat bubble over Brisbane. We did not create that. That did happen. I can't explain off the top of my head the meteorological events for that to happen, but quite likely there was some sort of high pressure system just off the coast of Queensland. It's been really dry. I was actually went up to Brisbane on Monday, so I know how dry it's been there. That the lack of soil moisture has, is a big driver of heat waves. We know that by how much we're not sure, but we know it definitely affects heat waves and hot days. It affects the latent and sensible heat fluxes. So generally if something's wet, so you've got lots of vegetation or lots of soil moisture, any sort of extra energy that's put into the system, so say a hot day would go into evaporating the moisture. Take the moisture out of the system and all it's got to do is, is in the sensible heat flux. It will just simply heat up the area. So that would have contributed to Brisbane having hot days as well. Um, yeah, so certainly there would have been some sort of high pressure system somewhere involved. But no, we didn't just go, oh, hey, let's just fry all the <laughs> world leaders and give them all the intense heat. I actually feel really sorry for them that they had to experience that day. I feel... I have two minds of that because I get really annoyed when skeptics or deniers or cranks or whatever you want to call them react to certain things like oh it's winter climate change doesn't exist. I, I really it really annoys me when they do that because they're just kind of riding on any wave that they can find. I know we do the same thing like the G20 it really highlighted the issue so I'm kind you know which is good for us but then are we also being hypocrites kind of thing so I don't know. Gosh, responding to sceptics, my reactions are varied. It depends who it is. If it's my seven-year-old nephew, then I'll quite calmly sit down with him and explain how it works. He's actually, if I do say so myself, pretty smart. So, you know, he can get it. If, it's my, if it was my 81-year-old dad, then sometimes I think, well, you're just not going to understand. Um, I try my best to explain it, but it's just a level of scientific knowledge or sometimes he was just firmly in his belief, so it's harder. Um, on Twitter, I've occasionally taken a couple on, you know, especially when they start getting personal and calling me like a lobbyist or something like that. And it's like, actually, no, I'm just telling you what's going on. So it really does depend. It also depends on my energy level. Sometimes I'm quite <laughs> battered down by them, particularly when they get personal. So. What, have you ever uh, encountered the argument that climate scientists are just are getting paid to... Oh, to... I have. And I, that infuriates me, I must admit because science doesn't pay. Well, I'm in a job, sure, but it doesn't pay nearly as well as, I don't know, having, you know, being a partner in a law firm or some, you know, 
economic firm. We're paid to, you know, we're, we're paid, you know, we're not on the poverty line. We're, we're paid well in science, but not near that. We're not on millions of year, or even on hundreds of thousands a year. We're, on, we're not on any of that. So, to say that a we're doing it for the money is not right, and b that the research grants that we get, we don't see. You know, that's going to our science. If we don't spend the money on our science, and we are accountable for that, we are audited for that. We have to give it back to the to the research grant, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. If I don't spend it, it goes back into the pool for someone else to use. Yes, that funds our salary, but we don't touch that. That goes to the university, and then they pay our salary. We don't get any. It's not like we get Christmas bonuses out of it. We don't even, you know, that's not even an option for us. So for people, especially people who are in high-paying jobs. Um, to come back and say to us, oh, you're just in it for the money, that it infuriates me because they know absolutely nothing about what's going on. And it's personal as well. I don't think the general public realise that we don't, well, certainly someone in my position, we don't have permanent work. We have to bid for these research grants to fund our work. But we're not doing it because we want the money or we want to, you know, it's a hobby. We have to prove that the science is worthwhile funding, that it has uh, impact for the broader community. Um, that something, yeah, something good is going to come out of it. And the ARC or the Australian Research Council isn't wasting their money. It's not like we just get handed out money every year. We have to fight tooth and nail to get that money. You know, there's sometimes only a ten percent chance you get your project funded, and they, they literally argue over these 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 um, proposals. They're not they're not easy to come by. So it's not like yeah, it's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's far from it. That's a very difficult question to answer straight away. As I spoke about earlier, we can say whether or not our activities have increased the likelihood of that event, an event of that magnitude. Has, is, can we expect, so if we have a heat wave where the highest, or the average intensity was 45 degrees, we can go, then go on and say, maybe not straight away, but we can at least look at our models and say, well, human activity has, say, increased the likelihood of getting that event two or three times. So we're going to see that event two or three times more often than what we used to without us doing anything to the climate. We can do that and that's, that's, that, those sorts of analysis are robust and we can say with a certain confidence once we've actually done the analysis. But saying whether or not did climate change cause this event outright, we can't answer that. Because we don't know, that heat wave could have occurred, sure, but maybe the intensity wouldn't have been as strong or maybe it would have lasted as long. But we just don't know, particularly in summer. So that, for example, um, the Australian open heat wave. It was summer, okay, so getting a heat wave at that time of year probably could have happened anyway, but in my mind it was more the intensity that was the issue. We likely would have seen it, but perhaps it would have been a couple of degrees cooler. Using the polar vortices to rebut climate change science is just outright wrong. <laughs> uh, so that was typical of weather in the region. What happened was the, the jet stream just was pulled further south in that region of the world for a number of weeks. And there was, so that the polar vortices, are, this, this is somewhat going out of my area of um, research, but from what I've read, they're common for that region. They do occur, you know, they're cold, but they can occur and they do occur during winter. If you go to the other side of the globe, Northern Hemisphere, but on the other side of the Arctic, they actually had warmer conditions as well. So it, it balanced out really. And that's, you know, if the jet stream moves down that way, you know, it has to pull from the other side of the hemisphere. And yes, it was cold, say in terms of 30 year records. Some places had the coldest um, winters on record, but not very many, a few locations at best. If we saw it, those winters occur more and more often, then I'd be a little bit concerned for that region. But the coldest winter in 30 years versus the hottest summer that we keep on blitzing, you know, year in, year out, or if not, we get very close to it. It's, it's, it's comparing the cold records versus the warm records. So in Australia, I think the number of warm, warm rec records we're creating, that number of the cold records, five to one, or I can't remember the exact number, but it's, that's, I mean, that's a sign that we're warming. Yeah, sure, we're occasionally gonna get a cooler event, particularly in winter when it's naturally cooler anyway. But the fact that we're seeing our warmer events far more outnumber the cooler events, that's where the problem is. And people need to look a little bit further beyond um, you know, news headlines to say that. So I have started a blog. Um, 
I do enjoy blogging, <laughs> but I guess my time management isn't very good at the moment to keep it up. So it's sarahinscience.com. I also, that's also my Twitter handle is Sarah in Science. Um, and my idea was, uh, firstly, just to talk about life as a climate scientist. I'm reasonably, uh, I don't know if young's the right word, but you know, I'm in a transition from a postdoc to academia. So I thought it might be, you know, a fresh perspective on what it's like to be a scientist because a lot of people, including myself, have, I used to have the perspective that they're all 60 year old men balding with big fat glasses and elbow patches on tweed jackets. So I kind of wanted to move away from that and show that we're actually, you know, some of us are you know, pretty young and pretty keen in our work. We don't like to always sit in our ivory towers. Um, and also practice my communication skills because I really think that we as scientists have a responsibility to communicate our work, particularly it's so topical, whether we like it or not, it is what it is and we need to do our duties as, as scientists. Um, yeah, and also perhaps talk about issues that people don't necessarily have a handle on. So, you know, for example, the polar vortices in winter, what should they believe? You know, I'm sure there's other blogs out there too that may address the issue, but perhaps someone might stumble along mine and go, oh, okay, well, okay, that's, she, she's in the know. Like if, I don't know, if I read a blog about how to buy a car off some car expert, then I trust their opinion on cars more than I would, you know, my mum's or something. <laughs> I've had a couple of friends comment and, you know, say, oh, that's, I didn't understand what that was about, thank you, or I didn't realise, <laughs> I think once I blogged about, you know, the stress of being a scientist and how you just got it, you feel like all this pressure about going for grants, publishing papers, communicating your work, blah, blah, blah. And it can be quite tiring and I don't think they, they, had, a bit of, they had a bit more of an appreciation of what we go through to actually do our work than just thinking that we just play around on our computers all day. Yeah. So I have had a bit of positive feedback. I think I need to put more time into it to get it back to where it was. I explained to someone yesterday who wasn't too keen on being in the media, think of it as explaining it to a seven-year-old kid. So I used the example of my nephew before and I don't actually, I've never talked to him about climate science, but I have him in my head and I know, well, Charlie, this is how it is. And try and have, I don't know if it comes across, but have that sort of enthusiasm in my voice that you talk to a kid and use words that they'd understand. Like if you think about, oh, I must not use jargon, I must not um, speak too fast, I must not do this or that, it becomes too much and overwhelming. But I find if you're speaking to a child, that just comes naturally. You know that their level of knowledge is not as well as your, not as good as yours in your field. So that's something that I think of. Um, one tip that has been priceless for me is only have three main points, three or four main points. And even if you repeat them again and again, it helps, it helps you to explain what you're talking about and it doesn't overload you know, who you're communicating to. And also know your audience. Speaking to a bunch of school kids is different to speaking to someone on the 7.30 report. And, just, and you know, don't be afraid. <laughs> They're not actually, and the media's not actually that scary. It can get a bit nerve wracking when you, know, you have a light in your face and a camera in front of you. <laughs> like it, this is, you know, actually this is fine, but when I've been in the studio before, I just all of a sudden I, I tense up and I try not to. And it is hard, but it is, you know, th I was thinking, like, you know, if not talking to children helps, think of something that does make you enthusiastic and try and, you know, be a little bit more animated. Someone else here got a website together and I thought, I can do that. How can I make a heatwave website? But it was just kind of stewing in the back of my mind. And I was just casually talking with a couple of people here and someone said, well, you know, you could do this. I'm like, and just, it just spawned, like, okay, well, yeah, we can look at all the different stations, we can look at maps of current heat waves, we can provide past records and a bit of context. But it just, it just kind of, it didn't come out of nowhere, but it's just something that was slowly built on in a couple of months and all of a sudden here I was developing it. But the, the main point behind it is for people to track heat waves over Australia. The Bureau of Meteorology provides a forecast of heat waves, but this kind of works a bit more retrospectively. It's like a record, I guess. And to put the context of current heat waves in the context of past, past heat waves. So for example, the outskirts of Brisbane had a heat wave earlier this week. How does that compare to a heat wave they had 50 odd years ago, or the hottest heat wave, or the longest heat wave, or what have you? So that's what the website's aiming to achieve. It, it does get more popular this time of year because this is when it's hot, though we can technically have heat waves in winter too. We actually had one in May last year because it was hot relative to that time of year. I do, ha I do have plans on developing it further and putting more interesting facts and you know records and things like that on the website because at the moment it only updates daily but I'd like to have it update hourly if I could um, 
but yeah, it was, and it was also, as I said earlier, I really feel like we need to communicate as climate scientists, even scientists in general. And the website, sh you know, that's the fruits of my labour. I was looking at how to measure heat waves, how they've changed over Australia. I already had the data there. I had the methodology there. It's been published in a paper, but what good is that to Joe Bloggs down the pub? He doesn't, you know, he can't access that. This is a tool that basically everyone can access and hopefully understand as well. Yeah, I think people can relate to heat waves because it is, you know, it, it is a weather event. I analyse it from a climate perspective, but it is ultimately a weather event. So it's, it's just happened, oh my gosh, was that heat wave really hot? Or how long did it last for? It's, you're right, it's something that people can certainly relate to. How heat waves are measured though, I do sometimes struggle in explaining that because there are different ways of calculating them. And the way that's probably the best way, the way that the Bureau uses, isn't exactly the easiest to, under, to explain. You know, the maths behind it is really simple, but if I was you know, explaining it to my partner, I think he'd vague out pretty quickly. So yeah, there, there's still a bit of difficulty there. Um, but certainly talking about you know, the, their intensity, frequency, duration, timing, etc., people can generally get a handle on that. So I've been working with someone from psychology to develop the website and see whether or not people are learning more about climate change, learning more about heat waves. And in that, you know, people have, some people have said it's really useful, some people, you know, the, the use of red is far too much, or, <laughs> which it is. I love the colour red, but it's a bit overkill. Um, I don't like the writing, can you put the statistics in a different format? Or, and there have actually been, it has been good feedback, because there's no point presenting this information if people aren't going to uptake it. So I, that's, th that sort of feedback is absolutely invaluable to me. Um, a lot of people, generally the, the consensus is it's, it's good and helpful, but it's just, you know, the devil's in the detail. In terms of tracking heat waves currently, or in near real time, I've certainly been able to do that. And a lot more simply than I thought was possible. Um, mind you, I didn't do the programming personally, but actually that all I had to do was make the website. Everything else was there. The data was there. The tools were there. I don't talk about attribution, not yet. Maybe, well, because I'm currently doing that work. So it's, again, that's the sort of work where the devil's in the detail. So I really want to make sure I've got those numbers robust, all that sort of thing, before I put them up there, if I at all do that. And it's also the work has to be published as well. I've always, so I've always looked at extreme events. My PhD was looking at extremes over Australia and how they're changing in an older version of climate models. And before I took up a job here, I did my PhD here, but then I went to CSRO for two years. And that's when, you know, we had really bad hot weather. And I'm thinking, God, how, heat, how have heat waves changed? You know, how, how do you measure them? And even though I couldn't work on them in that case because it wasn't my job, I just, it was just ticking in the back of my mind. You know, everyone talks about a heat wave, but what exactly is this sort of event? We don't, as far as I know, we don't measure it. I actually had a meeting with Lisa, I think maybe at a conference one time, and we both were discussing this. She said, yeah, no one's actually looked at heat waves. So it kind of laid down the path for me to slowly move into that. So when I took the job up here, um, you know, my, my job description was basically look at extremes over Australia, do what you want kind of thing. So I went, oh, heat waves, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that one. I, I guess there's a natural curiosity and a natural fascination there because um, they are so complex. We don't really understand everything about them. and It'll be some time before we do. Um, and they do have an impact, you know. Everything is impacted by weather and climate, particularly the extreme events. And especially in Australia, we're really prone to heat waves. They ha yes, they have happened before, but they're also changing as well. So we need to be able to cope with those changes. So my most interesting scientific question is finding out the human signal behind these events and not just the occurrence of the end result of the event, but the physical processes behind that event. So how much has humans changed soil moisture and what, what has made those changes occur? You know, what interactions in the climate system? Yes, we've pumped greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but how has that affected all the processes which then drive soil moisture, which, th which then go into effect heat waves? That's the ultimate question. I will not answer that in my lifetime. Probably no one will. We know things are changing, but linking those processes up is very, very difficult and complex. And I don't even know if it, if it is possible to do that entirely. Um, yeah, to, to me at the moment though, currently is working out the chain of events for heat wave manifestation. So we can measure them now. We know the general physical principles or mechanisms that cause heat waves. How do they all link up? 
in a climate, you know, in, in a seasonal climate system. So how does El Nino, for example, affect heat waves over New South Wales? And if we know the state of El Nino, can we then predict something about heat waves for that season? And how does that control the synoptics, which then controls the event itself? So to me, that's what interests me presently. But the big picture thing, I think that's what drives most scientists is the big picture thing, whether or not we get there in our own careers. Maybe 50 years ago, I wasn't alive 50 years ago, but maybe back then someone was like, oh gee, I wish we had good observations so we could measure these extreme events properly. Now we have those observations. We base our climate models on the physical principles we know occur in observations. So the science has moved on far beyond that, what they would have achieved in a lifetime, but they've helped contributed to those changes. Uh, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change on the events we're experiencing today, whether it's but particularly for temperature. So whether it's mean temperature, extreme temperature, uh, Australia, globally, we're already finding the detectable change due to humans. So we're not talking like we were 50 years ago, 40 years ago, oh, that this will be a problem. It is a problem. And I don't think people have the grasp on that yet. And I'm concerned that by the time they do, it will be too late. Sure, we will be, I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to um, have an impact on how much the climate will change, but it is already changing. So we're already past some point of no return. And now we have to work really hard to make sure that we don't pass that point even further. <laughs>